So uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, speaker uh, Richard Sates, who's a professor and chair in the Department of Community Health Services at Boston University uh, a Medical School. He's a primary care in internist who sees patients, and uh, he's certified in the uh, addic addiction, uh, addiction uh, medicine and has done a lot of work, uh, health services work, particularly on integrated care. So Richard's going to give us a little talk about that. Thank you, George. <clears throat> so I think my job in, in these sorts of settings is to shake things up and to um, tell you about things that, uh, that are contrary to what you might believe. And last week I did this at the NIDA steering committee for the Clinical Trials Network, where I showed evidence, one of three studies that will be published this year, which will um, pretty much conclusively show that drug screening and brief intervention has no e efficacy and is therefore not an evidence-based practice. But I'm not here to talk to you about that. So if you have questions about that provocative statement, <laughs> you'll have to catch me during the break. I'm here to talk about chronic care management for substance use disorders. And you can already see the provocation here that there are going to be some lessons from failure. So things are not always as they seem. This is a little bit of a playbook from Tom McClellan, that, and especially after lunch, put big capital letters on your slides and just a few points. <laughs> to get them across. So I'm going to talk about the problem, which you all know, so I'll do that briefly. I'll talk about the solution, the failure, and then the lessons from that failure. So first, the problem. Do we have a pointer also? If there's a pointer somewhere, I might make, if there isn't one, okay, then I'll use my finger. The problem. <laughs> So uh, this is a little bit, it reminds you a little bit of the comparison uh, that Tom was making earlier today. Um, and these are the percentages of people with health conditions who receive treatment. 70% range for hypertension, diabetes, and major depression, and around 10% for addiction. Now, th this, this is from a CASA study, CASA Columbia. Oh, thank you very much. This is from a CASA study at Columbia, but it was also shown uh, by Beth McGlynn in the New England Journal of Medicine about 10 years ago. And the reason I bring up that study is because she looked at uh, patient records, and if in the record it said alcohol dependence, it, it said that in the record, so the diagnosis was known, this wasn't an issue of not knowing the diagnosis, that only 10% of those people got anything that could be construed as care for that could have just been a recommendation to cut down, it could have been a referral. So not good. And there it is, people with recognized alcohol dependence received 10% of recommended care, and that was the lowest of the 25 conditions that uh, Beth McGlynn looked at at RAND. Of those that make it to some kind of treatment, and we heard Tom say 10% of people with, with addiction make it to some kind of treatment, and maybe starting with detox, only half seek any form of treatment after detox. And then fewer than half of those complete that treatment. This is not good. This is part of the problem. There's also a profound disconnect between evidence and practice. And the kind of treatment that you get for addiction often depends on what first what insurance you have, and then what's locally available, and even ideology. So imagine if I had sudden onset of substernal crushing chest pain, and I went to my local emergency room, and I got there and they said, you know, we don't actually believe in medications, and we don't do angioplasty. Uh, what, what if they said, now if you wanted those treatments, you could go across town, because there's another program, another emergency department across town where they do that. That would, we would be upset about that. We'd be really upset that they weren't offering all the known evidence-based treatments. And yet we know that if you look for addiction treatments, sometimes you, get, sometimes you get what's offered in a particular place, 
and that may not be the full range. And Tom McClellan, to mention him now for the fourth time in my talk, it won't be the last time I use his name, he, sur he did a survey about 10 years ago, published now in the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment, where he found that, um, if you, that, that addiction treatment programs often, for example, don't have someone who can prescribe. Now, there are medications that treat addictions. We should be using all the available treatments. How could you go to a place where it's a specialty treatment location, that is the specialists, the people who know the most about this, and then not have someone who can provide one of the treatments. It doesn't make sense. So th that's this disconnect, and this just um, shows you who's, who's delivering addiction treatment in the US. Where's um, oh, our SAMHSA administrator? There, there she is, right there. So who's, this is from SAM, uh, SAMHSA and ATTC Vital Signs. Um, who's delivering addiction treatment? And uh, there are 2% with a doctoral degree or equivalent, 1% uh, uh, with no high school diploma, 13% with high school diploma or equivalent. You get the idea. There's a range. And I'm not saying that that range of folks shouldn't be delivering addiction treatment. I'm just saying that there is a range that should be out there so that we can deliver all the known effective uh, treatments. Medical addiction and other mental health diagnoses and social issues often coexist and affect one another. And Tom made this point earlier today, and he also made it on a similar slide where there were lots of little references at the bottom. There's tons of these references. One of these, we did a, um, a study looking at who gets their flu shot and pneumonia shot. And if you've got alcohol or other drug problems, you're less likely to get those, those vaccinations. Your, your diabetes will be more out of control. Your HIV um, viral load will not be as well controlled. Tons of info on how addiction affects medical conditions, and then on how medical conditions affect addiction and how all these three conditions and social issues interact. But we've got separate places and systems that take care of those things. And that doesn't make sense because it makes it really difficult. So what might the solution be? The magic bullet. Healthcare reform comes along and gives us this magic bullet which is integration and chronic care management. And it's the best thing since sliced bread. Now, three, four years ago, maybe five years ago, Espert was the best thing since sliced bread, and it was a magic bullet. And so we should learn that when someone says, we've got this thing that's going to solve all your problems, that maybe it won't. That doesn't mean it's not a good idea. It doesn't mean it's not going to have a place. And I actually firmly believe that integrated care and chronic care management definitely has a place. It will have a place. But it's not as simple as just doing it. And we heard it earlier uh, today about how complicated it might be to do it. And so the details may be important. So integration is one piece, uh, and chronic care management is another one. And I'll say why I'm using those two words, because they're not exactly the same thing. So integrated care, like those puzzle pieces, uh, could overcome barriers um, barriers that are in the way to giving good care. You could balance confidentiality and safety. We heard an example of how that might be done in electronic medical records and by knowing that somebody's taking methadone when you're going to prescribe something else that might have an effect on the QT interval. Um, it means going not only across separate systems but making one system of care which we currently don't, don't have. Um, it can address, if you integrated care, it could address patient motivation. So if I'm a primary care physician and my patient doesn't want to go to see a specialist, that I can bring the specialist to them or I can do some things right there in my own setting. It allows me to take care of co-occurring conditions all in one place. And it should be able to improve the quality of care. And as a side effect, by the way, when we talk about how uh, the medical, medical professionals often don't know anything about addiction. As a side effect of integrating care, they may learn some stuff about addiction. And that's, I think, to all of our and all of our patients' benefit. Now, here, here's, I think, a nice way of talking about integration. There could, and this is what the alcohol and other drug specialist clinician would say, what the medical clinician would say, uh, what the medical clinician will say, what the patient will say. So in separate uncoordinated care, the alcohol and other drug specialist says, nobody knows my name. The medical clinician says to them, who are you? And the patient says, they gave me the wrong medicine. I have to go all over the place for appointments and nobody knows all of my problems. Coordinated care is the alcohol and drug clinician says, I see your patients. The medical clinician says, thank you, and you help my patients. And the patient says, Dr. Smith sent me to see you. I'm glad that you and he are in touch. 
Integrated care is, notice how there's only one quote for both the alcohol and drug clinician and the medical clinician. And they say, we are a team in the care of our patients and we work together to improve the system of care. And the patient says, imagine this. This is like the holy grail for me, I think. Today my breathing is a bit off and I drank heavily last weekend. I know I can get help, and I'll insert, for both of those things today during this visit. That would be pretty cool. That's integrated care. And one way to do this is in the primary care centered, primary care patient centered medical home. Why? Because most adults visit their primary care center or clinician annually. Um, it's a first contact place that should be accessible, and I know this may sound more ideal than it actually is in practice right now, but it's supposed to be accessible, comprehensive, meaning it takes care of the majority of your health needs, and it's got generalists and a team uh, approach. Key is that it's longitudinal and continuous care, takes care of the whole person, biopsychosocial, and addresses a population proactively, should make use of community resources, and it should address prevention, treatment, and then coordination of care when it, when it has to go outside of that uh, home. So that's an ideal place to take care of chronic conditions, and we know that some people with substance use disorders, with more severe substance use disorders, have a chronic disease. Not all of them, but, but many of them do, some of them do. So we looked at, this is a while ago now, and this is just an observational study. We looked at the association between receiving primary care, two or more visits in the past six months, and improving abstinence by about 50%. This was in people who were dependent on alcohol, opioids, or cocaine. And uh, it, just being exposed to primary care was associated with um, a, a, a substantial um, improvement in abstinence. And, by the way, also, although I don't point out these results as much, uh, lower addiction severity index scores, drug severity, and alcohol severity. Just exposure to primary care. And this was not fancy primary care. Okay, so we could integrate care into a patient-centered medical home, and we could even say that we don't need to study it, because right here, SAMHSA tells us, it says right here at integration.samhsa.gov, that integration works. So we know, therefore, that it must work. Um, and uh, if you look at the details here, it actually talks about um, integrating things for other, th other conditions, like for heart disease, and so I'm, I'm looking for the substance abuse and mental illness part. There's a mental illness thing over here in the bottom left, about one integration program. So, so it, it works, we think. It, it also saves lives and improves lives and reduces health care costs. I think we should really dig into that, though, and see what the evidence is. Look, here's a slide. It says, what's the evidence? What's the evidence for integration? Well, integrated care programs tested in primary care settings, we're talking about integrating into primary care, uh, have been um, tested in randomized trials for depression, anxiety, at-risk alcohol use, ADHD. Not for alcohol dependence, until the next slide I'm going to show, hopefully, um, and not for drug dependence. Backwards integration, so-called backwards integration, means when you take the medical care and you bring it into the addiction specialty treatment setting, which is also a good idea. That has been tested for severe mental illness, and it's been tested um, in two trials for uh, substance use disorders, one that Connie Wisner did, and who's going to be speaking next. Most of these studies both the integrating into primary care for those four things and the backward integration ones, severe mental illness and substance use disorders, show effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Um, they improve adherence to treatments, they improve clinical and functional outcomes, they reduce hospitalization, and they increase patient satisfaction. So actually, we're in reasonable shape so far to support the statements on the integration uh, works slide, although really we're, we're focused on two trials for substance use disorders. Yep. Don't worry about the right, this stuff on the right hand side, it's just meant to say there's a complicated model and there's lots of stuff in it. But the main things, I'm going to move now from integrated care to adding one other piece, which is chronic care management. So recognizing that these are chronic conditions, or for when they are chronic conditions, that you might want to borrow a page book from Ed Wagner in the Pacific Northwest who developed a model to address high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, depression. There were 100 randomized trials 
of chronic care management for those conditions that I just listed, include, in addition, uh, congested heart failure, other conditions, um, that show that it can uh, have effectiveness. And that model is this, that it's patient-centered, that the chronic disease is the priority for those visits and for the care that's given, that there's support for self-management so people check something and do something about the result of that checking, um, that the delivery system is designed around caring for that condition, for that patient, that there's decision support for the clinician so that they know when a level of severity goes up or something, they do something about it and they know what to do, or they can easily get in touch with a specialist who's in their system, not somewhere else that they don't know their name of, um, that there are clinical information systems to support this, and that they make use of community resources. So that's the model. And we thought that it would be a good idea to test this for uh, substance dependence. So I keep saying substance dependence. I know it's so last year, but um, and now it's supposed to be substance use disorders. But when we did the study, uh, it was substance dependence. And so we went beyond integration to doing chronic care management integrated into a patient-centered medical home, which is what some other people um, have been calling for. So now I have to talk to you about the failure. And the failure, um, it was uh, actually Harold Pincus told me when I uh, told him the results of our study, his response was, uh, well, it's not the most colossal failure. <laughs> so, let's see. This was chronic care management for dependence on alcohol and other drugs. We called it the AHEAD randomized trial, and it was to determine whether chronic care management for alcohol and other drug dependence improved substance use outcomes compared to usual disorganized <coughs> primary care. And we uh, published this uh, in September of last year. So it was a randomized controlled trial in primary care. And, and people got randomly assigned to either a prim we gave you a primary care appointment with a named person. You could choose the gender of the clinician and you could um, determine when the, roughly when the appointment was and it was only a few weeks out. That was what one group got. That's it, that's all they got. The other group got these things. They got longitudinal coordinated care by a nurse, an internist, a psychiatrist, a social worker who was addicted, all of them were addiction trained, right in a primary care setting, and they got uh, that care focused on substance dependence, alcohol, opioids, and cocaine. And it had all those things I just listed on the slide right before. It was what I would call the Cadillac model. People got two visits right from the start, 90 minutes each. Uh, they got addressed by those four clinicians, and the main focus was to engage them in ongoing care. We had identified them at a detox, by the way, and as they were coming out of the detox, we gave them these two visits, outpatient visits, during that first week. They got treatments for addiction, medical, and psychiatric conditions, depending on their diagnosis, their readiness to change, and their priorities. We offered them four sessions of motivational enhancement therapy. We gave them relapse prevention counseling at every contact. We gave them a primary care appointment in addition to this clinic, so they also had a primary care doctor in that clinic. They got referrals to specialty addiction treatment and mutual help, tailored to their clinical needs and to their preferences. They were all offered addiction pharmacotherapy if it was relevant and appropriate for them and indicated. Naltrexone, acamprosate, disulfiram, buprenorphine, we could prescribe there on site. And methadone, we would have to refer them for if that was appropriate for them or if they wanted it. And they also, many of them ended up getting psychopharmacotherapy, so SSRIs was a big one for people with co-occurring uh, depression, which was very common. The continuing care, they, would, they could come in for visits, um, they would have. They would also have care by the nurse care manager being in touch with them by telephone. Uh, they had facilitated referrals. That is not just here, go and call this 1-800 number. It was instead a warm type handoff referral. Um, they could come in any time during the day. They also had 24-hour pager access. And we would call them if we hadn't heard from them in a month. Any time during this 12-month period during the study. It seems it's a lot. The other group, this is the group, one group is randomized to this. The other group gets an index card with a primary care appointment on it. Here's what happened. I guess it is kind of small. Sorry. I will tell you. Uh, I'll tell you what the important numbers are. So uh, it, there were 282 people in the intervention group, 281 in the control group. So nicely balanced. We had. Um, uh, uh, 
almost complete follow-up. You can see we had 270 and 262 at 12 months later, so it's about it's well over 95, 97% follow-up. 59% uh, of these people, by the way, had reported one night on a street or in a shelter in the past three months at baseline. So I think it's pretty good follow-up for a group like that. Uh, and abstinence, the first row is abstinence from, from stimulants, opioids, and heavy drinking. In the past 30 days, assessed at 12 months. So at 12 months, using the ASI, we, had, we find, found out if they're abstinent from stimulants, opioids, and heavy drinking. And by the way, we also tested hair, and we tested uh, urine, and we tested uh, saliva. Uh, hair being the, 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 the best for a 90-day window. So this, this, these also, although I'm not showing them on this slide, I can tell you that the biological outcomes are perfectly consistent with the self-report outcomes that we have. And at 12 months, 44% were abstinent from stimulants, opioids, or heavy drinking, and heavy drinking in the intervention group. So at baseline, they were all using. 12 months later, remember I heard Tom talk earlier today about 50% or so at six months after some sort of treatment that people are absent. So we've got 44% here at 12 months um, absent from those things and absent from heavy drinking. They could have been drinking lower risk amounts, but not heavy drinking. Problem, though, is that in the control group, it was 42%. So 44% in the intervention group is actually worse than 42%. In the control group, it's not significantly different. There were no significant differences in substance use. So I wanted to spend time on that result so I can tell you all the other things that there were no differences is. Remember the Cadillac plan? The Cadillac plan in one group? Everybody else got a primary care appointment. No differences in abstinence from stimulants, opioids, and any drinking. No differences in ASI score. No differences in ASI alcohol or drug score. No differences in mental health-related quality of life, physical health-related quality of life. Nights in the hospital, days in the emergency department. Heavy drinking days, carbohydrate deficient transferrin, gamma glutamyl transfer phrase, hair drug testing, saliva drug testing. Um, and then we looked at subgroups and said, well, maybe it worked in the opioid subgroup because they could have gotten buprenorphine and maybe that's because that's such a super effective treatment. Um, but it didn't, it, it didn't work in that subgroup. It didn't work in people we tried, Connie's approach. It didn't work in people with substance-related medical conditions. It didn't matter if they were ready or not ready to change. It didn't work or not work any better in homeless people, people with worse mental health-related quality of life, recent addiction treatment. Um, we couldn't find almost anyone that it worked in, or that it made a difference in, by randomized group. The alcohol dependent subgroup did have, and this is a positive finding, and it was a pre-specified analysis, but I, it's not really something to write home about. I mean, we wrote it in JAMA, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a small effect in a score, a problem score, the short inventory of problems, was reduced from 13 to 11. It's a score that can range from zero to 45. And it was reduced from 13 to 11. It reflects fewer problems in the alcohol-dependent group with, that was treated with integrated care. So it, it was a finding, but really not a particularly impressive one. Now, you can say all kinds of things about the study, um, but I guess I'd say that if integrated chronic care management in primary care is so super effective, if it's the next thing, the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it's the magic bullet, then it should be a really big effect. We should have seen something. So my first conclusion is, it's not a huge effect, it's not an effect that we could detect at all if applied the way that we did. And I'll get back to that. Now we're not alone. So it turns out that even though there are lots of randomized trials for other conditions that are effective for chronic care management, um, there are some negative studies. And I think it's really important to learn from negative studies. So there's, there was a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease disease management program that was negative. There was a Medicare uh, chronic care management program for a number of different uh, diseases that was negative. Just last week, or two weeks ago, there was a piece in JAMA on uh, care management in patient-centric home. The conclusion, it was negative, and the, the editorialist wrote, one size does not fit all. And I think there's a lesson there uh, for us as we think about applying chronic care management. So th this, was a, this was a systematic review done by AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, before we did our study, or, or while we were doing our study. And they found that there was no, di no discernible effect of integration level, processes of care, or combination on patient outcomes in primary care setting when you did integrated care. That there were organizational and financial barriers to it. 
that health IT was remaining a mostly undocumented but promising tool, but not yet proven. That, that no reimbursement system had been subjected to experiment, and that no evidence existed as to which reimbursement system may most effectively support integrated care. And then, now we have a largely negative study, the only one of chronic integrated care management for addiction in primary care. And what Butler said, who authored this AHRQ report, was that without evidence for a clearly superior model, there's legitimate reason to worry about premature orthodoxy. And I think he's still right about that. And I worry about it a bit because integrated chronic care management is expensive. The list of things that I showed you, 24-hour beeper, four professionals who were there all the time and trained in addiction, that's expensive. And so we better be sure that if we apply it, we, we, we find out that it works, and that we find out for whom it might work. So what are the lessons? First of all, it's okay to disagree with Tom and <laughs> um, Tom followed up, it, as soon as the paper was published, we had this long email discussion, which by the way, I just answered your last one uh, just yesterday, because it took me, I had to digest all the stuff he was telling me, and I learned a lot from that discussion. Um, and Tom's main point, I think, um, is, has been that um, you know, people in our control group actually did pretty well. 40% were absent 12 months later. So there may be something funny about that. I think it's because we selected people. Whenever you do a, a randomized trial, there's some selection bias. It's whoever gets into the study. But the population was pretty severe, so I, I'm not too sure about how to, how to handle that. Um, but people did do somewhat well. Um, but I think you know, a single solution does not fix a complex problem. It's a complex problem. There are a lot of good ideas in integration. I mean, what, what, am I, what is Rich State saying? That we should do uncoordinated bad care? No, we shouldn't do that. But, so, so, but if we are going to implement integration in chronic care management, we've got to figure out who it's really going to work for, and it's not just this magic bullet. Here's, here's one that you guys may boo me out of the room on, and I'm sorry to say it, actually, but organizing care can only work if the care that's being organized has efficacy. Ooh. So it means that if, if we're really coordinating care, making sure people get that treatment, that treatment really has to work. And, and I'll pick on medications, because then I, I know I'll be in sort of safer ground there. We know that the best medications for alcohol dependence right now have about a 10% absolute risk reduction in heavy drinking if you, if you adhere to them in the best clinical trials. It's, yes, we should prescribe them, and yes, they're good, but that's a small effect. Now, if you take people who are complicated, like the ones that I showed you and that we did our study in, and then we sent, and they all got naltrexone, let's say they were all eligible for and got naltrexone, a known proven effective treatment that has a relatively small effect, we, you know, it, it gets washed out. Because some of those people aren't going to quite make it, some of them aren't going to take the medication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if, we, if we're starting with treatments that have modest efficacy to begin with, then organizing that care isn't going to be quite enough. And so we need more efficacious, more efficacious treatments. But that also hints where we might use chronic care management, and it's for things that we know are very efficacious. Hint, opioid agonists is one example. So we need to implement known efficacious treatments, all of them, not just the ones that we do in our program, not just the ones that we like, not just the ones that are easier or harder or whatever it is, all of the ones, because even implementing all of these treatments, we don't get cure tomorrow, right? So, so we should be implementing all of them, and we should be doing so in a high-quality manner, and we need more efficacious treatments, as I said. So it's not a magic bullet. It's not the best thing since sliced bread. But here's an old study, small study. Stephanie O'Malley looked at naltrexone in primary care with simple primary care management, where the nurse care manager said, are you drinking? How much did you drink in the last week? And are you taking your medications? And did you have any medication side effects? Or do you have any, any trouble cutting back? That was primary care management with naltrexone versus cognitive behavioral therapy with naltrexone. She found no differences in any clinical outcomes. They worked equally well. In our place, this is an uncontrolled observational study of buprenorphine care management. Nurse care manager manages the buprenorphine with a team, social worker and physicians, to coordinate that care in a primary care setting. 51% success at one year. You can think that's either good or not good, but I think it's not bad. Um, David Feline in the New England Journal compared all kinds of levels of, of counseling with buprenorphine. Doesn't matter, all the levels of counseling were equal, 
they all got counseling, but the, the different levels were all equal. But the big news was that in primary care, you could decrease opioid use to almost nothing by giving buprenorphine and counseling in a primary care setting. So it can happen. And this one at the Philadelphia VA um, and New York, David Oslin uh, led this study. This was uh, alcohol, uh, uh, alcohol management in primary care with medication management, simple counseling, versus special, full-blown specialty treatment by referral. All these patients were referred, which is one difference between our study, where we didn't only get referred patients, we went out and found them. Because I really care about all these people who aren't in treatment. If 90% of people aren't in treatment, I want to have some treatments for them. And that's why we went out to look for them. But th this was done in referred people, and in referred people who are interested in being referred, um, management in primary care was actually superior to specialty care. It's another one, don't, don't shoot the messenger, this is, here's, you can talk to David Oslin. Um, five times more likely to engage in treatment, and uh, two times more likely to have um, uh, no heavy drinking days. And probably the reason they engaged in treatment better is because they were getting all their things in one place. They were in primary care, and they got treatment for their alcohol dependence in primary care with a specific medication. So substance use disorders, uh, that here's another issue. Substance, abuse, substance use disorders are not one thing. So when we study chronic care management for medical conditions, we don't study chronic care management for heart disease. We study it for congestive heart failure. Usually we study it for class three or four congestive heart failure. So here, our study may be a mistake, um, but thank you, by the way, to the NHPLA and NIDA for funding us uh, to do that large uh, study. Um, uh, it, um, it, it, we maybe now need to backtrack a little bit and say, let's focus chronic care management and integrated care for specific conditions, maybe opioid dependence and buprenorphine, maybe alcohol dependence of a certain level of severity, and one or two of the medications that are known to have efficacy. Patients need real choices and attractive choices to encourage that help-seeking and referral to fix the part that I lamented about just a moment ago. So I think primary care does have some benefits. Integrated care and chronic care management, I mean, it has to be better. It just has to be. But the evidence is largely limited to addiction specialty settings. This isn't going to solve all of our problems, and it's only as good as the treatments that we have to manage. And I think it's most promising, and if you're the person who's going to pay for this chronic care management, it's most promising for specific disorders so far in help seekers. I wish that were otherwise, but it's in help seekers. Um, and um, it's unclear whether we should be targeting this to the most severe, who would maybe benefit from coordination, that's theoretically the case, or to the, and, and we probably wouldn't see benefit if we're looking at an uncomplicated person with mild alcohol, alcohol use disorder. Because then you put all, the, all, all that extra help in there, but they didn't really need that help, so you can't demonstrate benefit. So don't get aboard the bandwagon every time the newest thing comes out and think it's going to solve all your problems. But at the same time, she says here, I've heard the saying, but I never thought it was something that could actually happen. She threw the baby out with the bathwater. And um, so don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, take stock in, in negative studies and think about what they teach us and how we might focus best. But John Adams, during the Boston Massacre trial, said, facts are stubborn things. And whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the states of facts and evidence. I've shown you some facts. Seth Landfeld in the British Medical Journal, he's now at... Uh, UAB, I think, as chair of medicine, when implemented prematurely, before it's clear that benefits outweigh harms, and you might add costs there, wishful thinking can replace careful evaluation and an unproved innovation can become an enduring but possibly harmful or costly standard of care. So I think integrated addiction medical mental health care has great promise, I really do. Um, there's little evidence for chronic care management and integrated care in primary care so far and we may need to think about those things I listed, efficacy, patient choice, desirability, access, severity, which condition we're managing. And so the details and the specificity of this health services intervention really do matter, just like they do for other medical conditions. So I'll leave you with some free resources here if you'd like. You can sign up to get a bi-monthly newsletter supported by um, NIDA, in part, uh, where we summarize the evidence on alcohol, other drugs, and health. Uh, by uh, mostly relevant to generalist clinicians. 
Um, we've also uh, begun editing this journal called Addiction Science and Clinical Practice, which used to be published by NIDA and is now published by Biomed Central. And so send us your articles or read the journal. We'd love that. And this resource that SAMHSA supports, the Center for Integrated Health Solutions, um, and um, some, I saw someone else had her, her slides uh, today, Dr. Lim. Um, integrated Primary Care. These two websites have lots of useful information on integrated care, and I'll stop there and give this back to whoever it belongs to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maxine. So, um, that's so interesting. That's interesting stuff. And I'm wondering about the phrase, you can lead a horse to water but can't make them drink. What do you think was the role of patient utilization and uh, patient utilization and adherence? What would you say was the role of those factors in the results? The role of which patient? Patient utilization of services and adherence to oh. treatment. Right. Yeah, so we can't, we can't really say because, we, so the question was what was the role of um, a patient uh, using the treatments that we sent them to. Um, we asked people, so, so first of all, it was a diverse group, and so it wasn't like a study where you could say, you know, we're treating people with naltrexone and then we're going to, we, we're going to put something in the naltrexone so we know if they adhere to the, or we're, we're going to check beta naltrexone or something like that. We can't do it because the, the treatments were so diverse. But we did ask people whether they went to treatment, at least. And it, it was true, and this is the hypothesized mechanism of disease management. It was true that we increased receipt of specialty addiction treatment, including medications, including um, outpatient treatment. So um, there were more people in the intervention group that did get treatment, but not that many more. So you know, 10 to 20 percent more in one group versus the other. What I thought you were asking about leading a horse to water also, though, is to get in the door in the first place. And I think that's one of the true benefits of integrating care into the general health system, is if the patients are already there, they may not go across the street to the addiction treatment program that day, but if you keep talking to them about it, and we don't have any proof that this works from studies, but if you keep doing it over time, and over time, and over time, maybe one time they'll walk across the street. But I'd rather have the street in the same place. Yeah. Yes, did you control for uh, or measure the recovery support services that your patients were receiving? Thank you for that question. So this, so, yeah, it's like embarrassing. So there's, you always forget something, right? And um, so we did, we, we, did look for, we did look to see if people were, and this isn't what your question is, I know, but um, we, did, we did look to see whether people were more likely to engage in mutual health groups, and they were. Okay. And we did recommend that. Uh, but we were not good at connecting to community recovery services. We weren't good at that. And Bill White, you know, the study came out, and about a week later, Bill posted something on a blog and called me out for that, and I told him I completely agree with you. So we underused community resources um, in, in that piece. It, it would have been good to do so. So consistent sort of with that, I'm a little confused as to what what constituted the chronic care model. I get how it's integrated care because you have a lot of different services, sure. but I'm unclear what, was what chronic care patient about centered. So if these folks like did you do an analysis of all the patients and set to see that they had these specific needs, like forty percent of them had transfer issues or, you know, so yeah. you need to build that in or you yeah. needed peer support, so you had to build that in. Right. Know, were there decision support trees, algorithms built in that were followed? Was there a good case management? Were there regular team meetings? Yeah. To me, all yeah. of that is... So 90% of those things, not every single thing that you mentioned, but most of those things were there. The reason it was chronic care, how it was chronic care management, several ways I could characterize that, but the simplest is that um, there was no set number of visits, right? and they could keep coming back as often as they needed. Which so so right there, it's it's chronic care management. Um, the the um, you asked about um, some of the other components of the care. Well, why is it patient centered? It was patient centered because everybody was assessed and evaluated and given the things that were known to to work for their particular condition. Not a one size. It wasn't a one size fits all. We did have. Uh, protocols that, you know, if someone was alcohol dependent and if they were willing, we prescribed a medication. If they were opioid dependent and if they were willing, we 
prescribe an opioid medication uh, agonist. Um, so those are just some examples. I can't give you like a full list because we it would take you know three hours, but um, but that's that was there. Yeah. This is partly, I guess, in support of your severity hypothesis, but also with the other studies that you put up there showing some effectiveness when it was integrated in a specialty care setting. Is there a possibility that your study really just had a figure in the ground? kind of reversed, that you're recruiting people coming out of a detox unit. So by definition, they're up at the higher end of severity. And I think that the, both in mental health and substance use disorders, the more severe the disorder, the less good they are at utilizing the healthcare system. But they're very good at finding the help in the specialty care settings. And so I'm wondering if you just had the wrong intervention in the wrong setting. Yeah, I think it's possible. I mean, I think we had the right intervention for the people that you're, that you're describing. And then the question is, would it have been better if we had done it in a specialty treatment setting? And that's possible. And that model works um, in medical settings, too. So if you, if you have mild kidney disease, you get taken care of in primary care. If, you've got, if you need dialysis, you get taken care of by a nephrologist. Um, that said, though, we actually brought the, I, I don't so much think it's the explanation, because we brought the uh, addiction uh, expertise into that primary care setting. I mean, they were essentially, they had all that expertise right there on site, which may not be reproducible. It may not be feasible to do that in a primary care setting. So this, isn't, this wasn't a run-of-the-mill primary care setting. We installed all this stuff that probably wouldn't have been practical to do in the real world. But I'm not so sure. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for, for making us all think critically. You alluded to the, the pulmonary paper. In that paper, there was actually increased death. There was. Death. There was increased mortality in the disease management group in the pulmonary paper. That's right. So we have to be really careful as we think. Yeah, you've got to test these things. And, and actually testing them, even if it's, it's not so much to come out with this works or doesn't work. It's to come out with um, how might it work and how should we implement these things if we do. When you're standing up here and you see Tom McClellan raise his hand, you're like, no, oh, it's I, my point, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. One interpretation of your findings is that primary care doctors currently reluctant to treat addicted people, seriously addicted people, had 40% improvement rates by your study. Yeah, so, so it wasn't the primary care docs, really. I mean, with these guys were, oh, you mean in both groups? You mean because of the control group? I say in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yo. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the control group had 44, 42% abstinence at, uh, at 12 months in the past 30 days. Um, and uh, I, I, I can't attribute that. I just can't attribute it to the primary care docs. I mean, I'm not talking about research methodology. I'm just saying I, I, the, that group of, there's a hundred, there were over 100 primary care docs there. Some of them are residents, some of them are attending physicians. I just, I, I think it, I really think that was selection, but uh, that, that we found people who a year later, Tom disagrees, but, but remember, early, remember my earlier slide? <laughs> you, can't, you can't have it both ways. I mean, it's, if that was the intervention, then you, you can conclude. I'll make two quick. It's before or after, it's a before or after set. That is, people were 100% using a baseline, 12 months, 40% were absent. Absolutely. So we know that something happened in between there, and these were all people who were leaving detox, and Tom tells me, and I believe him, because that that's a good rate, that that's a really good rate. Right? And, and my, answer, my answer is that it was a trial, and this happens in randomized trials, because right. right. you, you select people. Right. And Tom's answer is it could be um, uh, what they got exposed to, primary care docs or the and I can't say that it is or isn't. You need another try. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was there any consideration for patient-centered or person-centered planning or person-centered outcomes? Yeah, they were all. They were all um, person. So they weren't all told that they had to be abstinent. They weren't all told. I mean, it was. It was. We used motivational interviewing and relapse prevention counseling. So it really all was tailored um, to people's stage of readiness to change. It was tailored to. Um, their, their condition, uh, if they use multiple drugs, which priority, what, what, which drug do you want to work on, that kind of thing. Is that what you mean? Well, I guess what I mean is were their life goals identified up front and how close did they meet based on the interventions that were or were not provided? Right. I can't tell you how, how well each individual person 
met their goals. I can tell you that they reported getting chronic care management. We used a validated scale to detect that, in fact, they did get chronic care management. And I can also tell you that we used motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement therapy, which, which do that, but I can't tell you the specifics for each, any individual person. Let's give Dr.